I'll probably mute myself. So. And we all get to say continue. <laughs> You may talk amongst yourself if you want to while you're waiting for people to come in. <laughs> well, you can all see that my my head is pretty pretty healed. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this the scar. Yeah, you, yeah. This this getting hurt thing, you people need to stop. It. Really cool. Yeah, that was just wacky. You know, I, maybe it was a deadline you were trying to get out of. I don't know, but I was trying you, to do too many things at once. What you know, did you some, trip over? My own damn feet. <laughs> Okay. okay. Well, stop taking the, the term deadline I seriously. A, I was carrying a glass bottle, and I had uh, I had an aunt who fell on top of a glass bottle, a uh, glass coffee pot, and almost bled out before anyone got to her. So I was very concerned about not breaking this glass bottle, and instead I ended up doing this to my head. <laughs> All <laughs> right, no. guys. I think we're ready to go. <laughs> on that note, uh, Megan, go ahead and start the introduction, please. <laughs> My name is Megan. I am from the University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington, and I would like to welcome you all to our event tonight, which is day two for Turning the Tide. We just want to thank you for supporting a local independent bookstore. University Bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in the region. Uh, in fact, we celebrated our 121st anniversary this year. Um, and as a reminder, copies of the book will be available to purchase. Uh, we'll be posting the links in the chat as the event proceeds. We do have a fun event for you tonight with multiple authors uh, presented by the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers. Turning the Tide is a collection of uplifting and curious tales that will take you through the centuries and from the depths of the oceans to the stars where you'll discover well-known beloved characters in new settings and circumstances. Sherlock Holmes, John Carter of Mars, Hopalong Cassidy, Mulan, Dracula, Mina Harper, The Three Musketeers, Cyrano de Bergerac, Baron Munchausen, and Frankenstein's Creature are just a scattering of the literary souls that will populate these pages. And there's quite a few cats too. Uh, tonight's event will be moderated by Jean Raby. Jean fills her home with dogs and books, lots of dogs and books. She wears worn out sandals to work every day. They turn 18 years old this summer. Jean is a mystery writer living in a tiny Midwestern town that has a gas station, a Dollar General, and a marvelous pizza place with exceedingly slow service. Named a recipient of the Faust, the Grand Master Award of the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers, Jean is always working on a project, or three. She has 40 some books published in the fantasy, science fiction, urban fantasy, and mystery genres, and she's edited more anthologies and magazines than she cares to count. In her spare time, she dabbles in role-playing games and board games, and at every opportunity, she tosses tennis balls to her cadre of dogs. Uh, before we get things started, I just wanted to let you know that if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A portal. Um, you'll find that tab at the bottom of your Zoom screens, and we'll get to as many as we can of those at the end of the event. Uh, and now I am going to turn the stage over to this evening's moderator, Jean Raby. Well, good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce some of the authors from this amazing anthology. I hope you've picked up a copy of the anthology. It's, it's a one of a kind, and it's a very thick book. We have Aaron Rosenberg, Nancy Holder, Stephen Sullivan, Will McDermott, Jonathan Mabry. Is Tim Wagner here? Yeah, I'm here. There you are. There's Tim. I think I go back the farthest with Tim. I think I have everybody here. So what I want to do is I'd like each one of you to talk about your character and why you picked him for this anthology. Let's go with Tim, since you're right there. Tim. Well, I picked Hearn the Hunter. Uh, because I wanted to create a character. The way I approached this was I decided, you know, let's pretend that there is a TV series that I'm tying into. So I, I said, 
well, what what kind of character would uh, you know somebody go to and try to make a TV character out of? And I thought about how you know they went to Grimm and they went to Sleepy Hollow, you know, taking public domain characters to to, to create sort of a supernatural action adventure TV series on. And I thought Hearn the Hunter would be perfect for that. It's got a nice ring to it, you know, Hearn the Hunter. It sounds like a TV series. Plus, you have the term Hunter in there. And you can kind of do, you know, whatever you might want with it. And so I decided to go ahead and make Hearn an action adventure type character who, along with his uh, companion, who is a shapeshifter that turns into a hound. And their goal is to deal with the wild, which I imagine is uh, kind of like a, a supernatural sort of aspect to our world, like the the magical kind of primeval part of our world, you know, and there are creatures from that and magic from that. And they're the ones that, you know, guard against that. And so then once I had that whole pretend TV series in mind, then I came up with a story <laughs> as if I was doing a tie in for it. And it worked really well. It would be an incredible TV series. I just love the story. Okay. Oh, so I'll you. go to somebody else. Um, I feel like a teacher calling on people, you know, in class. Um, Stephen, Stephen, tell us about your speaker spooky. today, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a, a number of Steves in the tie-in group, um, and, and uh, Stephen Paul Levy, I think, was on uh, last night. He's a friend of mine. I write about monsters. I've always written about monsters, even when I've been writing fantasy books. I've been writing about monsters, and recently. I decided to write about some classic monsters and I've got, I don't know if you can read that, Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors is uh, my classic monster series. And in it, I have used some characters from Frankenstein and from Dracula. And so when the call went out for this, I thought, oh, I'll do Frankenstein. But then I think Nancy was doing Frankenstein. Was it you, Nancy? Yeah, <laughs> she was doing Frankenstein. So I said, I'll do Dracula. But I'm not doing Dracula directly. I'm actually doing the daughter of Mina Harker, who is uh, named after Mina's best friend, Lucy, who, if you remember the book, became a vampire and died. And Lucy is not a character from the book. She's a character that actually is born after the book. And it's about her and how she relates to her mother's legacy and her father's legacy, because uh, her, her, both her parents were involved in the original Dracula novel. And it's about how their involvement with Dracula passes down through her as uh, kind of a curse. And it's called Blood of Dracula. And I don't want to say too, too much about it, but it's, it's set in the same milieu as Dracula. And it will eventually tie in with my Dr. Cushing books as well. So that's, that's why I chose it. And that's where I'm at. And I think people will like it. it it was a lot of fun writing about her and, you know, in keeping with the uplift part of this, I, I think it fits in, even though it's, it's a little weird. <laughs> it's not weird. It's a little eerie. I thought it was really nifty. I get to pick somebody Thank next. You. Will. We'll go to Will. Okay. Uh, so my story uh, <clears throat> is uh, about the Norse god Balder mostly, uh, and Loki gets a, a little bit of a, an appearance as well. Um, when we first started talking about the anthology, um, my thoughts went to mythology uh, and Norse mythology specifically because I've, I've always been fascinated by Norse mythology. I have a, I have a, a textbook I think from a college course that I one of the like two or three textbooks that I've held on to for the past 23, 20. I don't know. I'm not going to guess years. Uh, so anyway, what I wanted to do, and I've thought about this many times over the years, is to write a myth, a mythological story set in as if it were another mythological story in the setting. Uh, and so I was reading through this textbook of the Norse myths, uh, looking for a good place to insert a new story. And uh, I started reading about Balder because I've always liked Balder. And um, he has two stories and they both relate to his death. There's the dreams of Balder, which are all about these nightmares about his death. And then the death of Balder, which then kind of goes on from there. And these are important 
stories because the death of Balder leads into Ragnarok. But the thing about it is that Balder is this, he's the, the best of the gods. He's the fairest of the gods. He's this wonderful God who has no stories except his death. And so I thought, well, we need a story that shows him being heroic. And so I wrote a hero's journey uh, about Balder, but because I like to twist things around a little bit, um, Loki tricks him into it uh, because Loki is, if you know anything about Balder, Loki uh, brings about Balder's death through mistletoe. And so the story is Balder, um, Loki tricks Balder into taking mistletoe down to the uh, to Midgard, to the Druids in the north who are in the middle of a terrible winter and are pining for greenery. Mistletoe stays green throughout the winter. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a bringing fire to the, to the humans kind of heroic story with a twist. Uh, so it, it's heroic, it's uplifting, but it's also playing into Loki's machinations. And I won't it's say timing on the Loki thing too, man. <laughs> you know, Loki Loki. Came right out while there's a Loki series on. That's awesome. Loki is <laughs> fun to write. <laughs> really, really fun to write. Well, it's a marvelously plotted story. In fact, the neat thing about this anthology is all the stories are so rich and varied. It's like a master class in tie-in writing. And, and maybe we should have built it as that, you know, if you want to know about tie-in writing, you should get this book and read it. Uh, we'll go next to, well, we should go to Jonathan. Jonathan had a wonderful story. Well, they're all good stories. They are. Hi, I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I'm the president of this group of very strange folks, creative, but odd. Um, my story it deals with uh, the, the world of John Carter of Mars from Edgar Rice Burroughs. And somebody in, in the chat had asked if, if those were in public domain. The first three are. And before I talk about my story real quick, I just want to mention that normally media tie-in writers work with things that are not in public domain. We work with things that are under license to different companies. But for a, a, an anthology as complex as this, trying to get all of these licensors to agree to let us write stories would be impossible. So we just kind of did an old school version by taking characters that a generation ago would have been under license and we wrote those and uh the stories are amazing i mean I, i'm so proud to be in this anthology with my colleagues my story uh, i'm a big john carter of mars fan i i was one of the very first books i ever read was princess of mars and i think i read it when i was seven or eight and it just turned me on to adventure fiction um i i always love the fact that he went into a world and became kind of a catalyst character where as soon as he's there, the entire structure of that world began a process of change. Granted, violent change, but, but change. And his end goal was to eventually bring peace to all of Mars. So I wanted to write a story that jumps forward to essentially that moment. But I didn't want to, it's going to sound strange, I wrote a John Carter of Mars stories where he doesn't appear until the very end. I actually wanted to focus on other characters, characters whose lives were completely impacted by him and whose um, uh, aspirations, whose, whose sense of honor, all tied into the vision of John Carter. So it's a couple of old soldiers and, and, a, and a group of their followers who are going to fight a big battle that they know absolutely they're going to lose, but they want to lose in a glorious way. They want to write, lose in a way that would have songs written about them that would echo in the halls of Helium, the, the, the capital city. And um, it's one of the rare stories that I wrote in one day. I sat down and I just could not stop writing the thing, banged it out, fell in love with the story. Um, and um, I, I've heard from a lot of you know, folks who are big John Carter fans that it makes a nice uh, you know, ending to the John Carter story. I wish that it was possible for me to write a, no a novel based on that, but the other stories are not only in license, but they're tied up with, with future movie things that are going on. But one day I do intend to come back to John Carter of Mars, secure the license and write an expanded version of that story. That would be a whole bunch of fun. Wow, that would be wonderful. I would love to read it. But I read so much of your stuff anyway. Um, I'm gonna real quick, go into mine and then we'll go to Nancy. I love dogs. I have dogs. 
I probably have too many dogs and I have one at my feet right I've now. I've never noticed you love dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wrote a story for this anthology about a dog. And I tried to find the vehicle to write about a dog. This was about my very first dog. And so I chose the ghost of Christmas past to, to pull back to that memory. And, and it was kind of a bittersweet thing for me, but it was kind of therapeutic. And I just thought, you know, what a great excuse I had to, to write about this and to use a, a tied in character, Charles Dickens, no less for this. So that's my story. Now um, I'm going to go to Nancy. When we started getting the stories in, and I love every single story in this book. And when I was talking to my co-editor, um, Bob Greenberger, he was saying, well, we got to worry about what order to put these stories in. And I said, they're all good. It doesn't matter. They're all good. We just don't put the Sherlock Holmes ones next to each other or the Dracula-like ones next to each other. And he said, so you don't care? I said, no, they're all good. I said, but I want Nancy Holders to go at the end. Hers has to be the last story. And he was like, okay, but why? And I said, because it made me smile. And I want people to leave this anthology smiling. And so, Nancy, that's why you're stuck at the end of this book. Okay, so Nancy, talk about yours. Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley. I'm a huge Mary Shelley freak. And um, it all came about because I was asked to write a graphic novel of Frankenstein for the bicentennial of Frankenstein until we realized how many graphic novels of Frankenstein there are. So we decided to jettison that whole thing. And instead we decided to, to um, concentrate on short stories and novellas that were written by women who were as famous as Charles Dickens or Bram Stoker or many of the guys we've all put in this anthology, but their names have been forgotten or put aside. And Mary Shelley's fame would allow Mary Shelley and the creature to unearth them and dust them off and tell their stories. So I'm gonna hawk my book right now. Um, I have a graphic novel called Mary Shelley Presents Tales of the Supernatural. And so I'm all about Frankenstein. I have so many pop-up books of Frankenstein and I have novels and I have her biography and her mother's biography and the rights of vindication of the rights of women, which her mother wrote. I've been to her grave. I've been all over Italy to where she lived with Percy Bysshe Shelley, her husband. She was a crazy woman. She eloped with him when she was 16 and he was married to someone else and they went off to Europe and um, she had children. They tried to raise one of them from the dead in a seance. She was nuts. So how could you not write about something that had to do with Mary Shelley? So I decided to write about the creature and I wrote about, uh, he gets a kitten. And so then what happens to him with the kitten? And that's why my story is about what it is. And thank you for saying that it made you smile because it made me smile too. And that's the end of my diatribe over. Shelly is, she's and such And I a, see that we don't have, go ahead. Her characters are so terrific. I just finished a, a Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, a kind of a resurrection story that I've submitted. We'll see if it actually gets accepted, but just her imagination and then the power of her, her prose and stuff. It's just amazing, obviously, because, you know, it's yeah. lasted 203 years now at this point. So you can't see the bottom of my shirt. I'm wearing a Monster Conservancy shirt and down at the bottom, it says founded 1818. And that's for, for Frankenstein, for the, you know, the original science fiction horror story. So, and the original science fiction story for that matter. So that's great. pretty cool. Well, a disclaimer, I've made a solemn vow to read everything Mary Shelley ever wrote. And some of it is really boring. Some of it's really good. Some it's really boring, 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 sorry. And the the most recent Stoker I read was just terrible. It was Lair of the White Worm. And I love that. I love that film. And the story is awful. It is just yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. So what is one thing she wrote that's boring? Because I'm curious to look that one up. Um, she wrote a, a lot of short fiction and some of the short fiction is quite boring. And then she wrote the very first plague novel, which is called The Last Man. And um, there's it's also a soap opera. And there's this long involved the people and falling in love with each other, blah, 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 blah. And it goes on and on and on. And um, it's really drawn out. But it is the very first plague novel, like Omega Man or, you know, those those things. Mary Shelley was the first. Cheery, cheery mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. Do you know that we don't have a single question? And I know we got people watching us. Sorry, right. you still have people to ask, right? Ah, there's a question. I see a question. It says, oh, it's Raymond. Ah, hi everyone. Your introduction writer lurking in the audience. My question is, if a movie was made of your story, who would you cast? Well, that's a good one. Jean, I, I don't think Aaron has spoken yet. No, he hasn't. Yeah. Aaron. Aaron. Unmute. Don't mind me, I'm just sitting in the corner. I have to tell you before Aaron starts to talk, Aaron. <laughs> Aaron was awesome. Um, he initially wrote a story that we weren't sure worked to tie it. Well, well, if it was public domain, we thought it was public domain. And so we went in and out and in and out. And in the end, we aired on the side of caution. So Aaron jumped in and turned around and wrote something else. And I hope he found a home for the previous story. We're still, kind of we're, hopefully pointed you there. Yeah, no, it's we're 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 waiting to see. Yeah, it's it's sitting in the queue. So yeah, I mean, fortunately, both so, both stories were a lot of fun to write. So I wasn't I wasn't sure if we were going to mention the first story or not. So it'll appear somewhere, man. Yeah, <laughs> so. hope so. But uh, so the story I wound up doing, the second story I wound up doing was about Sinbad the Sailor, um, which. You know, he's one of the original swashbuckling action heroes. I mean, how can how can you not love Sinbad? And I grew up watching those movies, you know, with the Ray Harryhausen, you know, stop motion zombies and, you know, skeletons and everything. So when I was kind of surprised when Gene actually told me that that one was still available, because I was, thought for sure somebody would have snapped up Sinbad. So I'm like, oh, yeah, totally going to do Sinbad. Um, but then, uh, you know, both, both Jonathan and Gene have, have edited me in the past, so they both know that I... I like to turn things on their side a little bit. And uh, if you actually read the original Sinbad stories, the original stories, they all follow the exact same model, which is Sinbad starts out with a ship and a crew and they have you know, all the supplies and everything, and then horrible things happen to all of them. And somehow Sinbad makes it all the way through to the end, richer than he was before, but only Sinbad. But right, everyone else. Every died. time he manages to con another crew basically into going back out with him on another voyage. Yeah, you know. Well, hey, just, someone else is gonna come back with money at some point, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, that's right. They they always look at him, you know, he's he's like the car salesman, right? He's always like, Oh yeah, no, it's great. I come back with all this money, and no one ever stops to ask, but what about your last crew? Where are all they? So, you know, that was the story I had to tell, which you know was just fun like okay how, how do we how do we play with this one so my story is called the model sailor and i won't say anything more about it and all fantasy game masters who read your story will create the adventure for their player characters i hope so I it hope would so. make it would make a great role-playing adventure yeah <laughs> and it was harry Housen's birthday yesterday which i oh, celebrate every year i Perfect. watch his films all day yep my personal holiday. <laughs> because, and kind of answering one of the questions, one of the things that's inspired me over the years has been Ray Harryhausen uh, and his his films and his work. And I think it shows in a lot of the stuff I, I do. I, I, was, I actually got the Q&A to work for a moment <laughs> without crashing my computer. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> and with Aaron talking about him, it's like, yeah, all, all props to Ray whose films and Dan, there are about 15 of them that show amazing imagination and hard work and inspired, you know, not only probably a lot of us here, uh, obviously Aaron and 
and I, okay. but also people like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and just, I hope that some of us someday will, there will be people that will look at our work uh, collectively or individually and say, yeah, I, I got into writing because I love these guys. And, right. and, and that, that's the highest compliment. So and, Aaron, yeah. who would you have play your Sinbad? Answering Raymond's question. Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, what's his name from, um, see, I'm terrible at names. Um, he was on Lost and he was on um, um, Sense8. Um, Josh Holloway. Holloway, right? Josh Holloway? No, no, no. No, he's the... Um, oh, uh, Naveen Andrews. Yes, yeah. yes, Naveen Andrews. He would be awesome. He's awesome anyway, So, but he would be awesome at Sinbad. He would. You know, from Lost, Hurley, the guy who played Hurley would make an excellent ghost of Christmas past. He's he's a lot of fun. I've seen him in a couple other things. He's he's really good. Yeah, he would be my ghost of Christmas past. Jonathan, who, who would be your star? Funny, I, I actually cast my stories when I write them. So uh, I had uh, Ron Perlman and Stephen Lang in mind. Uh, as the main two characters. Oh, so nice. Um, I think they'd be great. They'd, I think they're, they're, their chemistry would be fantastic. And uh, they can both play a little bit of weird humor as well as the, the, the aging action hero type. So those would be my guys. And Ron Perlman loves dogs. He does. So, so that's a win. So Will, Will, who would be Balder and Loki? Well, I hate to cop out on this, but I don't think you can do any better than Hemsworth and Hiddleston. I mean, I mean, I realize Hemsworth is Thor, but he's just so pretty that he would be a wonderful balder. <clears throat> and, and Tom Hiddleston is Loki and always will be as far as I'm concerned. He just has absolutely nailed that role. Uh, I don't know that they can ever recast it. <laughs> Maybe Liam Hemsworth for that one, since he's the yeah, slower version of the Hemsworth brothers. That's that's probably a good idea. Go with go with yeah, Liam, one of the other Hemsworths. Yeah, they're all very pretty. Yeah. So Stephen, what about your Mina and Lucy? You know, I when you said this question, I was like, oh God. <laughs> I don't know because sometimes, very very occasionally, like. In Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors, clearly Dr. Cushing, there's a clear role model for who I'm thinking of when I'm writing that. But a lot of times I don't think of actors as the characters because I, there's been a kind of a whole kerfuffle in, in fandom about how could you cast X as X? You know, how could you cast Tom Hiddleston as Loki? Why would you ever do that? You know, and, and just to use an absurd, absurd kind of thought. Um, so I, I tend not to do that. I tend to try to be, well, if ever they did this, I would be happy with whoever they chose to play the part. Um, but just kind of off the top of my head, and now as, after I had the names that Aaron wanted, i forgetting the gal's name, and my wife's not here to remind me. me. Sorry, she, my fault. <laughs> she's playing Dream Girl on, um, on Supergirl right now, I think would would be a, a, a pretty terrific uh, young young Lucy. Uh, and I'll leave the other characters as nebulous because like I said, I, I haven't been really thinking about, about it in those terms. Well, now, and now I'm stuck because now I can't get Hurley out of my head as the ghost. You know, it's just kind of like, thank you, Raymond. So Nancy, what about you? Oh, a long time ago, I co-edited an anthology with a writer named Nancy Kilpatrick and we had a story written by a writer named Bentley Little and Bentley Little is famous for being reclusive and his bio said that he lived in the middle of the desert and is hideous to look upon so he would be my Frankenstein monster and any cute little kitten would be the kitten although I would be tempted to cast against type and revive Grumpy Cat but we'd have to we'd have to have a meeting with Grumpy Cat's manager about that. But 
Well, maybe you'd have, you'd have to bring in Dr. Help. Frankenstein to bring <laughs> Grumpy Cat back from the grave, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah I think it'd be kind of cool, but we'd have to see. But Bentley Little, Bentley Little, cool. got to be my star. Well, Tim, who would be Hearn? Yeah. Muted, yeah, sorry. I got bumped off a bit ago and then I came back. So I guess I came back muted. Um, I'm terrible at coming up with ideas for like who would be actors to play my characters. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who play Hearn, but Hearn's a younger guy and the, the shapeshifter hound that's his partner was actually his parents' partner because they were hunters too before they were killed. So it needs to be somebody older and somebody with a sense of humor. So Patton Oswalt would probably be really good for that character. Uh, not sure about her himself though. Hmm. Okay, I'm looking to see what other we got here. Ah, here's a good question. Who was your second choice to write about? And what non-public domain tie-in character would you choose? Nancy, you're up first on my screen. <laughs> well, I um, I had, I was very lucky and got to novelize the first Wonder Woman movie with Gal Gadot, and I would love to write about her Wonder Woman because she is awesome and gorgeous and matcha. So um, I would say Wonder Woman. Aaron, any of y'all can jump in. Aaron. Well, so obviously I, I did wind up writing two, but. Uh, you know, I think if if Sinbad hadn't been available, I think my next choice was the Scarlet Pimpernel, um, mm -hmm. who I love and doesn't get enough love. So that would have been amazing. Um, non non public domain tying characters. I mean, probably the probably the non public domain one I've always wanted to write and haven't gotten to write yet is Doctor Who. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I I uh, was on the fence about what to do for, for this anthology. Um, if I had had the time to write another story um, or had the opportunity to do one, I probably would have gone and done something else with the, something with H.G. Wells, uh, War of the Worlds, because I'm doing a Dr. Moreau story for an anthology right now. So I'd probably do as something with the War of the Worlds, my favorite, listening to David Tennant read it on audio right now. It's just an incredible book. But for non-public domain, um, I've, 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 I've worked with a, with a bunch but um, probably uh, I'm going to lean toward uh, Blake Seven, which unfortunately, you know, is, Ooh, is, is not a market that my agent would take me to because um, it's a lot of the cast was involved in it and Paul Darrow was involved in it and so on. So uh, I don't think they're doing Blake Seven's books now, but that's one of my favorite series, science fiction series of all time, with I think the single best last episode of any show I've ever seen. And uh, so definitely Blake Seven. They're still doing the audiobooks of the Blake Seven with the, the original hmm. cast, I think. Hmm. I should I should have my agent reach out. You should, you should because we've we've judged some of them. We do um, the scribes as a, a set of awards we do every year, and I'm, I okay. I've been on the audio panel and I've reviewed a number of the Blake Seven ones. Oh, I must that. have missed those on on the ballot when they yeah. were on. Cool. So I, I spoiled mine <laughs> off the top by saying I was going to do Frankenstein, but <laughs> apparently I was really fast on the draw with this, but apparently Nancy was even faster on the draw. She was. <laughs> I was. And She's I said, I want, to do, I want to do Frankenstein's monster. And Gene said, <clears throat> someone's already doing that. I was like, how is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went into the milieu. And the, the crazy thing is I actually have that Frankenstein story. I had it in mind. As soon as you said it, I was like, oh, I've got this one I wanted to write. So that would be my, my first choice. And ironically or not, I, I haven't found time to write it there. It's still, it's in my notebooks and, and all the little scrawls in the commonplace book. Uh, maybe we should do another anthology. I'm totally maybe up we that. should. Yeah, that maybe we should do another <laughs> anthology. <laughs> It's, it'll be another three ring circus if you do. So uh, I would choose the Frankenstein monster if I had to do it again. Although if my Bride of Frankenstein's monster story doesn't sell, <laughs> I, I might be looking to place that in there. If I was to choose any, any characters that I could write about at all in an anthology, I'd probably, someone said they'd choose one they hadn't done, right? And I'd probably choose one I haven't done and, and that would be, 
I'd probably choose Spider Man, or I might choose Batman or Superman. You know, I got oh, to do Iron Man, the Fantastic Four, and officially, so that was really fun. If I was going to pick one I've done before, I'd probably choose the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because they were they were a blast to write for comics, and and they were the Mirage people were they were a dream to work for. I can't say enough good stuff about them. So. I guess that'd be four, <laughs> four characters, wow. four different companies, right? I, there are a lot of ones I'd, I'd love to write again or write for the first time. I do the scarecrow. I thought about doing the scarecrow from Oz because, because looking out my window is a big cornfield. And if I look out that way, there's soybeans. And so I felt inspired to do the scarecrow, but I wanted to do a dog story in the end. And, and, my dogs would only do something bad on a scarecrow. So, um, Kim, what about you? Um, you know, I picked her in the hunter because I figured nobody else would. <laughs> I was trying to, I knew everybody goes straight for Dracula and Sherlock Holmes and everything else. Uh, plus I could do, you know, pretty much what I wanted with it. Um, there, you know, maybe I would pick somebody who would be like a, a character that wasn't developed as much, like maybe in, in the, the original property. So like maybe Renfield or um, like Frankenstein's assistant or something or Dracula's three wives. Well, they made, somebody did novels of those now that I remember. Um, for a, like a, a, a property that's owned by somebody right now, um, I would love to do any kind of Star Trek because I grew up with Star Trek and I love all the Star Treks. There is no bad Star Trek as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I've come close a couple times, but never actually got you know a Star Trek gig. So I'd love to do that. I'd like to do Conan. Will, what about you? Conan so, um, when I was thinking about what to write, the other thought I had in my mind was was fairy tales. I've thought many, many times over the years about writing new versions of fairy tales, which, you know, everyone has done, which is the hard part of finding a good fairy tale that hasn't been modernized or done a retake tell of or, uh, and so that's why I eventually uh, went over to the, to the myths. And, and like I said, I'd always wanted to write a myth in the form of a myth, uh, which answers one of the other questions was, you know, I definitely altered my uh, my writing style when I was writing the myth, much more narrative than I usually am. Uh, my stories generally have more action and dialogue than, than narration. Um, and so that was, that was different in my story. As far as uh, the non-public domain, I'm such a huge fan of Discworld and the new uh, series, The Watch, which are my favorite characters in Discworld. Uh, just blew me away. And I would love for that to open up the ability to write more stories about the watch. And I would jump on that in a second. Cool. Nancy? I, I thought of another one. <laughs> I would love to do any of the any of the characters from Dark Shadows. Ooh. Oh, That's yeah. So I, did, I said Wonder Woman, Jean. I've already had my. Say. Oh, that's right. You know what? We have a bunch of good questions, so I'm just going to throw one of them out there, and a couple of you answer it. They want to know what inspires you as a writer, and nobody's answering. That. I'll be happy to jump in on that since you know. <laughs> um, it, and inspiration for writers is is often built, you know, built into us. It's hardwired into us. I don't remember ever wanting to do anything but write. I have done other things, quite a few other jobs over the years, but writing is is a you know something that is fundamental to to who I am. My brain is wired to tell stories. Um, so inspiration then comes partly because as as writers we're looking for it. We look at the world in a kind of a weird, quirky way. I mean, if if somebody sees a hummingbird outside their window and they're not a writer it's like oh cool it's a hummingbird outside my window i'm wondering what the hell that thing wants why it's looking in my window why it's here right now what's its agenda and what is it really because it's probably not really a hummingbird you know so we start going into building some sort of a story around mundane things that's how we build our careers and so on inspiration is everywhere when I was uh, 13 years old, I got a really great lesson from a couple of writers at an event in New York. It was a, a, a cocktail party at a publisher's house. My 
middle school librarian brought me up for it. And it was Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Harlan Ellison. Uh, uh, I think Arthur C. Clarke was there that night. There's a whole bunch of, of, of people. And it was, I was 13. So I was like, you know, in the me, really <laughs> yeah. And they, you know, they told me the, the difference between seeing something and having a concept and seeing and taking that concept and developing into a story. And it, it's something that stuck with me. And from that point on, I was always playing what Bradbury called the what if game. So inspiration is, is now automatic to us. When you're not working as a writer, sometimes that triggers a little harder to pull. But when you are working as a writer, I mean, you're, you're a gunslinger when it comes to coming up with ideas. Everything, you, you know, you have more ideas than you will ever, ever have time to write. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I, I tend to write all my ideas down in, in a commonplace book, which is like this. I was, I was wondering, since you were talking about ideas all the time, and that's how I deal with it. <laughs> do, the, do the rest of you have like commonplace com books or notebooks or something you deal with? I just have files a on bunch. my computer. I basically just, I write it down. I stick it in a, in a folder called Notions on my computer. And whenever I'm looking for the next thing to write, I'm not saying I have something contracted. I just go in there and say, yeah, oh, what sounds, what sounds interesting? I carry little notebooks. I can stick them in my pocket. So when I'm out with the dogs or I'm at dinner with friends, I can drop everything and copy down the conversation to the table next to me because that's got to be used for something. No, seriously, one of the things that inspires, I think, writers is that it's one of the few professions in the world, and in general, it doesn't pay very well, but it's one of the few professions in the world where you can give people a good time. There's all this bad stuff happening right now, but you can give somebody a story and, and they'll say, you know, that excited me, that made me happy, that made me think, that made me forget about all the bad stuff for a while. It's, it's your chance to, to make a mark. Yeah. One of the things that, that always inspires me, especially for tie-ins, is the gaps. Um, you know, I, I love to look over something, especially if it's one of those properties that's been around for so long and so many things have been written about it, but there's always these little nuggets floating off in the corners, you know, someone mentions a line in passing about someplace they've just been, or, you know, someone shows up with something and no one really bothers to explain where it came from. Those gaps are the things that get me excited because it's fun to explore those and then to try to seamlessly fit that in with the rest so that it is of right. a piece. You know, we, we had one comment, somebody asking about, you know, trying to match the styles. And, you know, whenever I write in another IP, I try to match that style as much as possible. So it really is trying to seamlessly blend that in so that, I mean, the goal for me at least is, you know, I want someone to be able to read it and not really be able to tell my work from the original work, at least in terms of the style, the tone, the flow, um, but that I'm adding something to it and giving them a little extra depth. Okay, that's good. That, that was a perfect answer to one of our questions. One of our other questions is, when you're creating, do you outline? How detailed do you go with your work? Or are you what's called a pantser, where you just sit down at the computer and, and go at it? Outline, Me, outline. I outline. I don't, I, I can't pants. I actually, on, on really, on short stories, I'll often just write down a couple of sentences and then go because I've discovered if I write an outline for a short story that's detailed, I don't end up with a short story, I end up with a novella or a novel, as you have experienced in some of your anthologies, Jane. It's like, here, give me 3,000 words of this. And I'm like, will you take 10? <laughs> and the answer is no. So short stories, I'll see to the pants a little bit, but novels, I'll yeah, I'm a structure guy. I, I outline my, my novels I, and my short stories, but my, my outlines are not like the prose style outlines. It almost looks like a synopsis. It's just bullet pointed, little little notes to give me an idea of what's in each chapter, mm -hmm. because I want a, a, at least the, the equation, the mathematical formula of cause and effect that ends with a, an empirical ending. And it allows me to build in motif. It allows me to build in subplot and, and lay clues and work toward a cohesive ending 
It also prevents me from writing things that are self-indulgent because each each writer loves to write certain things. Um, you know, they fall in love with certain characters or, 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 or plot lines, but they don't necessarily serve the novel or serve the story. And I don't want to have to cut them out later on. So the more I outline, the easier it is. And with, with, with novels and short stories, I typically write the, the outline, the beginning, and then the end. And I back up and aim at, aim at the ending. And it has speeded me up by um, at least three times in, in, my, uh, in my production um, to the point where you know, I'm now knocking out a novel every three months and, and uh, it's not something that's going to be a raw draft. It's a little more polished because I'm used to that process of, of getting the story in line and just racing toward that ending. Yeah, I've done that too. Yeah, I, I always outline mine. No, novels, I'm, I'm like you, Stephen. If, for a short story, I don't outline. I'll, I'll make a couple notes so I have some idea of where it's going so I don't just go completely off the rails. But novels, I, I like to think of it as a roadmap. You know, I, I like to see exactly where I'm going, but I also leave enough room in there that if I want to detour a little bit here or stop a little bit there, if that speeds up a little bit, that's fine. And yeah. I always adjust my outline as I go. So by the time I reach the end of the novel, my outline still matches what I wound up with, which is important for me because that way if something doesn't make sense, I can go back and look at the outline and still compare it and go, okay, wait, but this, what happened here? I lost something in there. And if I don't, if I don't update it, then I'm completely lost when I go back to it. Yeah. And to that point, Aaron, real quick, I just want to add one thing. Even though we, we a lot of us write outlines, it, we, you generally are not married to them because you can't rationally expect to have all your best ideas, ideas yeah. the day you write your outline. Oh, okay. it's, it's a roadmap. It is, it is not set in stone. Yeah. It's absolutely. a roadmap. It's not an itinerary. Yeah. Yes. And outlines can vary in length. Sometimes I might do a book outline that's only two, 3,000 words long. But the outline for the current book I'm writing is around 16,000. I just kind of, yeah, I know. I just kind of. I know, it's, it's crazy, Gene. <laughs> we, have it's a, we have a fun question. Um, Jonathan kind of directed it at you. Uh-oh. How often do, does your dog figure into your work? Did you put your dog in there? Oh, do I put, I actually have a carving of Rosie. One of my fans did for me. It's really nice. As you can see, she just conquered the Cthulhu. Um, Rosie has not herself appeared in any of my books, but dogs of various kinds, and they're all based on dogs that I've had, show up in my books. Um, and in my novel Glimpse, there was a dog heavily based on Rosie, but because it was a scary horror story, I didn't want my, uh, uh, the people who love Rosie, which are a lot of my fans, to be too upset so I, get, I i just changed a little bit of the dog but it's clearly that dog so yeah well, well my my story in tight in was was all sprung from a dog but i've used dog personalities too one of my tie-in books had uh, had was was nothing but goblin characters and my editor said you have to make them not human so my main characters each one was based on a dog that i knew or i had had and he was so pleased with them. And I thought, well, they're just my friends. So um, we have another question that asks, other than our story, do we have a favorite story in the anthology? I wouldn't answer I loved all under, of them. I, I wouldn't answer that story under torture. Oh, um. Nancy, <laughs> she may know. <laughs> I would not say. I would not want to hurt the feelings of my friends, and I love the stories, so. I, I can tell you one thing. There's not a weak story in the bunch. So that's a really, really rare thing to say about an anthology. It's it's a series of hits all the way through. Right, yeah. It's like, oh, this one was really good. Oh, wait, this next one was really good, too. Oh, wait. And, 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 and quite a few great. that I wish I had written. It's like, ah, oh, darn it. That's always a good sign. Yeah. yeah. So we have a question, will there be another one? And what characters would you like to see in it? Well, I think we've all just laid, just called dibs on our characters, right? Scarlet Pimpernel. Yes. Right. Nancy, oh. who are you gonna do that's not Frankenstein? Or are you gonna do another monster story? Huh? Frank, oh, who would I do? Yeah, who would you do in the next one? Domain? I'd have to think about that. I'm not sure if it's public domain, I'd have to, I'd have to, well, you know, I am a big Sherlockian. I'm very, very into Sherlock Holmes. So maybe not Holmes because everybody does Sherlock Holmes, but maybe somebody else in the Sherlock Holmes world. I'd probably do that. 
Yeah, that'd be a cool idea. We I all seem to, we all seem everyone's going like I'm really into Sherlock Holmes and I'm like, yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm really into John Carter. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Sinbad. Well, yeah. We could in the Sherlock Holmes edition. Yeah, we what? could do it. Monopoly. We could have Sherlock yeah. Holmes. One thing I would like to do at, at some point is to yeah. see if I can line up some licenses that would allow us to do short stories. Sherlock Holmes edition. Some active active I'm, I'm sorry, You're, you cut out. And I didn't realize you were speaking, so go ahead. Oh, no, it just says my internet connection is unstable. So oh. I want to get another question out there while my internet is still working. Okay. They said, who are your favorite literary influences? That's a good question. Always a good question. Um, my first, one of my first loves was um, Shirley Jackson who um, wrote The Haunting of Hill House. And uh, there's an excellent movie from 1963, not the remake, just 1963. <laughs> right. The scariest movie ever made. Sorry, bar none. And um, so Shirley Jackson, she was kind of my entree. And comic books. I loved comics, eerie comics, weird comics, Vault of Horror or whatever. Loved them. Scary and creepy. I turned them over at night because the covers would freaked me out so I was a little girl and I would turn all my book co my comic book covers over so I don't know why crazy but but that's those were my influences I mean I'm my background's in English lit so you know Jane Austen and Mark Twain are two of my first loves um, you know when you start getting into genre you know I started with Ursula K. Le Guin, Madeline Longle and Andre Norton which is a hell of a trio um, and then went to, you know, wound up with things like Roger Zelazny, who's one of my all-time favorite authors. Um, Tim Powers, you know, Tim Powers is one of those people who I read his books and go, wow, I will never be able to write like that. It's amazing stuff. Um, I agree with you there. And I love Tim Powers. And right? I, I read his stuff and I'm like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I read Robert E. Howard that way. It's like, uh. <laughs> How did he just do that in, in two sentences and it would take me a whole paragraph? I don't get it. How you wrote a novel called it? The Stress of Her Regard, which has Keats and Shelley. Oh, yes. I love that one. Love Great it. book. When I was first starting out as a writer, um, uh, writing for Magic the Gathering to start with, uh, and one of my big influences early on had been Bob Salvatore, who wrote uh, the Dungeons and Dragons novels, the Driss, mm -hmm. Stuart, and um, I just loved the way he constructed uh, a fight scene. And uh, I definitely was influenced by his fight scenes when I wrote fight scenes in my novels. And for me, mm -hmm. I mean, Bradbury and Matheson, obviously, as, as a kid, but Michael Moorcock, absolutely. Oh, yeah. uh, Carl Edward Wagner with his Kane stories, which sadly are out of print now. Um, and the, the mystery writer, Ed McBain, for his, his ability to, uh, the, the way in which he structured dialogue and structured paragraphs, very similar to the way Harlan Ellison broke up the paragraphs into um, more dramatic beats, though that type of writer really uh, uh, influenced me. And John D. McDonald with his Travis McGee books, um, one of the best approaches to character development that I've, that I've ever seen. Tim's being so Heinlein quiet. A bunch too. Heinlein, Le Guin, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, the good, the the non non crazy personal H.P. <laughs> Lovecraft stuff. <laughs> Just had to add that. Yeah, Tim, what about you? Well, it, what haven't I read that's influenced me? I mean, everything that you guys have mentioned has been stuff that's influenced me. So I've been trying to like think, you know, what is it that, uh, that people haven't mentioned? Um, Piers Anthony was a huge influence on me. It's Xanth oh, yes. Just yep. the the amount of sheer weird creativity that was in those things and the amount of fun. Um, well, even in my horror, I'll, I'll go ahead and use that sort of thing. I don't know if anybody can recognize it, but I know it's there. Um, Lawrence Block, his fiction and also his nonfiction about writing was yeah. really instrumental uh, for me, just not only to learn, but to also help me develop how I write about writing. So I think in tons of comics, Nancy mentioned comics. Um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of the, the horror comics, creepy and eerie, Stephen mentioned eerie. Um, but also just, you know, when I hit Marvel comics and their approach to character, uh, probably when I was like in junior high, they was a huge influence. 
Uh, and I, I think uh, the comics have influenced a lot of us because you'd, you'd read Spider-Man and one week he's, he's fighting a mobster and the next week or the next month it's an alien and the month after that it's a vampire. And all the genres just kind of like in superhero comics especially, they just are all over. They're just so entangled. But I think a lot of us really end up writing kind of you know, cross genre slipstream stuff, regardless of how it's labeled because of that. So that was a huge influence for me too, to be able to take all these different elements and put them into a single story. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's it's like, um, who influences you by genre? Uh, to be honest, Tim, Tim is one of my favorite horror writers because he's got an elegance to it where, where you just love to read the words. The words are just smooth and you can just evocative and and then there are other horror writers out there that all they are squish you know so for horror I look to I seriously look to Tim for police work police procedurals I look to Ed McBain and and for flow of characters um, George R. R. Martin but not for his Game of Thrones I picked up an old book called Fever Dream and and it was moody and, and mystical. And it was about vampires on a riverboat. Mm -hmm. And in the opening scene, when he describes the two main characters, the vampire Joshua York and Abner Marsh, I was blown away. I was talking to Joe Haldeman about it at a world fantasy convention. And I said, Joe, when I read this and I was a newspaper reporter, I decided I wanted to write fiction. And he said, Gene, when I read that, I decided I should stop. <laughs> because he didn't think he could equal that. So we spent the next hour talking about, about that book. So I don't know. Good book. Pick it up. Um, we should, because we're getting close and I don't want them to turn us off before, Jonathan can tell us what's going to happen Friday and what the Scribe Awards are. Yeah, Friday, we will be at 4 o'clock Pacific time, 7 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, I'll be on uh, Facebook Live. Uh, announcing the winner, the nominees and winners of the Scribe Awards. The Scribe Awards are our, our annual awards for the best in media tie-in writing. It celebrates the different kinds of writing, fiction, nonfiction, original, adapted, um, nonfiction, you know, short and long forms. We have such a, a wide variety of superb writing every single year from our members and from folks who do media tie-in who are not yet our members. Um, it, it takes a lot of different forms. Uh, if you haven't read many Italian writers uh, writing, go read it because it's a hell of a lot better than you think it is. It, it got a bad rap for a while back, back in the day that is, was not earned, uh, deserved then and certainly isn't accurate now. Um, and it's fun to, um, uh, to present these awards and to celebrate, you know, another great year of fantastic writing. Jonathan, how do they find it on Facebook? If you go to jonathanmayberry.com and spell my last name right, it's M-A-B-E-R-R-Y. Um, uh, or, I'm sorry, go to Facebook and look up Jonathan Mayberry. Um, it'll, it'll be live streamed there. Um, and it won't be a long ceremony. We don't have that many categories. Um, and there's a special award I'll be giving out as well, um, including our Lifetime Achievement Award. And it, it will be a, a fun way of celebrating things. Just go look, look for it on any of my Facebook pages. There'll be a link on the International Association of Media Italian Writers Facebook page. Um, you'll, it's easy to find, and there'll be links on Instagram and uh, Twitter as well. And what time is that? Friday? Four Pacific, seven Eastern. Friday. And and you're right. I want to, as someone that's been on the, the the judging panel for a number of years, I want to reiterate the, how much good stuff there is out there this year in the audio. The audios were particularly good. They're always good, but we had two or three that I was like, I don't know which one of these I'm going to put on top of my list. So it's amazing. Another amazing. good year. This has been a lot of fun and it's been great. Um, I, I have, some of you guys are my friends who I haven't seen for years. And so doing this chat was awesome. Our anthology is a seriously good piece of work. Uh, maybe even what's better about it is that it was done as for the benefit of the World Literacy Organization. So we all wrote for a good cause and I hope we raise a lot of money for them because it's a great organization. Reading is just so important. And is there anything that anyone else would like to add because we're close to when they're going to turn us off? All the author royalties of all sales 
all the money that all of us here and everyone in the other two days doing this would have gotten is going to this world literacy. So go out there and buy it, read it. You're going to love it. That's a good closing note. All right. So Jonathan, we should do this again. Yes, we should. And uh, yeah, that'd be I, I, I have I have plans. That's great. You know, I, I see Gene and, and, and Will in two different writers groups over the month usually, but it was so good seeing the rest of you here. It was like, wow, we should do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to just say a quick thank you. Thank you, Gene, for moderating. Thank you to all of our panelists. This was a really fun evening. Thank you to our audience for joining us and spending this hour with us. Um, if you're interested in getting a copy of the anthology, we have dropped some links in the chat and it's available through ubookstore.com. Um, again, thank you all so much for spending this past hour with us and everybody have a great night. Bye. Thank you everybody for coming.